my name is Peter Hilton. Um, I'm not going to explain myself. I have a website for that. Um, but please follow me on Twitter, because that will make me happy. This presentation comes from thinking about domain modeling a bit. Um, and I've written a number of blog posts uh, about these topics, slides linked to those. There are some links. Um, I'll post those on Twitter as well. Um, the URL is all at the end. So you should go and read my stuff as well as listening to it. I recommend that. I'd like to start with a sort of a sort of a DDD joke, which is um, about how you perform a denial of surface attack on, on people who want to model things. Uh, you, if you can get people to try and come up with a single unified model of a customer, they will never finish. It's impossible because uh, no two departments in a company can agree on what that is. And this is kind of a central problem in domain modeling, perhaps, in, in data modeling. And this is not the one I want to talk about today because it's worse than that. So this kind of modeling usually is about thinking about the relationships between, between entities in a model. Um, I don't want to talk about the arrows between the boxes. I want to talk about the lists inside the boxes. And in particular, what are the values that you model in particular entities in your domain? And not so much which one should you have, how long is the list. That's not even the thing that I'm interested in today. But actually, what, what are they and, and what kind of types do they have? So you have these kind of universal values like people's names that are not specific to your problem, to your application. Um, they're not application specific. So you have things like, yeah, so the names, other identifiers, people have identifiers like um, uh, person numbers, social security numbers or whatever it's called in the country they live in. Um, they have addresses, they have genders, there are numbers, there are all sorts of things called a number that people have. How do you model these? Because if you just say, well, that one's text and that one's a date and that one's number, you're not done yet. That's not enough. So that's my claim for today. Mapping it to a JSON type, not good enough. Um, I figured that I would look for examples of these universal values that are not application specific and uh, show you that some of these things have been solved already um, and that this would help you. So let's start with the example of somebody's name. In this case, uh, cyclist, uh, Annemiek from Floater. Very successful cyclist, has lots of medals. Um, as well as medals, Annemiek has a given name and a last name. Um, the last name has a Tussefuxo. <laughs> yeah, this is awkward because, especially if you're a native English speaker working in software in this country, sooner or later somebody is going to ask you, how do we translate Tussefuxo? Like, what do we call that thing, that word, in, in the name? Um, who has a suggestion? Wrong. wrong. Um, anybody else? No, still wrong. Um, good, three good attempts, and these are not terrible. Um, but the thing is that this is what is known in domain modeling as a trick question. The correct answer is do not model that. Do not split apart the name. Decomposing names like this into separate parts is the wrong thing to do. It takes you in the wrong direction, and it will lead you into trouble, bugs, and non-inclusive software. It's even country specific, so that's kind of where the problem comes from. In this country, I guess in the phone book, this is sorted with the floatants. In the US, this would probably be sorted with all of the other funds. Um, and in some countries, their software will just say, ah, you've got a space in the name, that's not allowed, we don't do that. <laughs> not even kidding. And so this is where, um, if you were in Marit's talk before the break, you would have known about falsehoods that programmers believe about all sorts of things, of which my favorite is obviously the one about names, at least today. Famous article by Patrick McKenzie has quite a long list. And in the middle of the list are these four entries um, about this idea that you will not have to deal with these problematic other kinds of names that other countries have. Even if the whole kind of first, you know, given name, last name thing doesn't even work in this country, um, elsewhere, it could be even worse. The problem is, 
this is not just a bug. It's worse. It's morally bad. It's, it's non-inclusive. You're not allowing people to use their names in a, in a, in a natural way. Um, we have a special name for this kind of, this special sort of non-inclusivity. We call it being racist. And first name plus last name is not where you want to be with your software. Um, this is problematic because it is very hard to get away from this. You need to interoperate with all sorts of other software that makes this same wrong assumption. What should we be doing instead? Well, what we should be doing instead is first reading the World Wide Web Consortium's guidelines that explain the error of your ways and give you some very sensible advice, um, which largely boils down to don't tell people that their name is invalid. Allow everything. Don't try and split things up and parse names. So if this were a different talk about HTTP, I would be telling you that a URL is not subdivisible. It's opaque. It's an identifier. Don't parse that. Same with people's names. Do not parse them. Do not assume that we're given three words, that one is a given name and two are family names, or the other way around. You just don't know. Um, this is the first example of the, what you need to do instead, which is to think about your specific purpose in using this data and use it for that purpose and model it accordingly. You probably just need somebody's full name. If you want to sort by that, you need a new attribute to sort by for that purpose. If you want to greet somebody in an email notification, then maybe you should ask people how they like to be addressed, because that you cannot deduce from their name and get it right, except for a very narrow list of countries. Um, you know, there are plenty of countries in the world where the formal way to address me is Mr. Peter, for example. Not something your software is going to get right for those countries. Now, this is a, a bit of a list. So the, the TLDR here is that if you ever make any of these mistakes, you are unsure why this is a problem, first you need to go and follow um, Your Name is Valid on Twitter and see daily examples of software developer bugs. But, but then come to understand that among all of the bugs that you are inflicting upon users of your software, this is perhaps the one that they will take the most personally. They will not like your brand or your company. This is maybe not where you want to be. It's not a good place. And above all, do not tell somebody that their name is invalid. That is really quite rude. So I feel like I've started really badly that I was hoping for some sort of you know, positive modeling experience and, and reuse, and, and names are a problem, so let's move on. To the joy of country codes. Country codes are what we want for this kind of thing, where nicely standardized, um, a set of two-letter codes, um, uh, language codes first, country codes after. Remember which one is in uppercase. Don't get that wrong, please, because you could mix them up. Um, a nice, consistent set. If you can find a standard for a value in your model that has a list of correct values, you're winning in all sorts of ways. So enumerated types are where you want to be, if you can. Because then questions like, is this a valid value, become trivial. How do I store this becomes trivial. Um, there are others. Um, as you all know, the currency codes start with a country code, and then one more letter. Uh, we don't use all of them anymore, though. Um, probably a good thing. So these kind of codes, standardized lists of codes, can be very, very useful. Um, you can perhaps invent your own, but finding the standards and, and using the applicable standards will save you modeling effort, will make your software more interoperable. And data migration projects will be less painful. Like If you ever feel that you know everything as a developer, then uh, do a data migration project. It will be, be character forming. Um, another kind of thing that, will, that you'll need, and not just standard identifiers, um, when modeling text values, but we'd also need actual standardized names. Uh, needing to do this kind of thing in your software, to translate names of, of languages or, or currencies or countries or days of the week, um, can be quite daunting because you don't want to get it wrong, it would look bad, it would be embarrassing, and people would hate your software. The good news is that this particular kind of stuff is a bit of a solved problem thanks to this website from the Unicode Consortium, who, for their common locale data repository 
project have clearly spent all of their money on the data problem and not on a web designer. Um, this is very 25 years ago. It's sort of almost you know, nice, nice retro. Anyway, so the website is not what you need. What you need is the data, which you can get from GitHub. This is um, standardized translations of a lot of different lists of stuff. Uh, wonderful. Very useful if you're localizing software because there are certain kinds of names that you don't want to be um, doing on an ad hoc basis. And the best part is that they are identified by standardized codes. So things like months of the year you can number, but things like languages, you need a code to identify the same language in a currency where you uh, sorry, in a language where you can't even read the alphabet. So this is a great win. This stuff is quite complex, especially if you look at the XML version, um, but can be a real lifesaver and prevent bad localization bugs. So these are different kinds of text that I've been looking at. Um, we can go down the rabbit hole a little bit on text because I said you're not done if you've decided that this attribute is text because there's more than one kind. So the days of the week, these kinds of things are, are natural language. But some text, is, well, some text values are identifiers. They have different kinds of properties, such as being a specific length or, or being unique. And you cannot treat these two things in the same way. So for example, with natural language, you can capitalize it on stylistic grounds for a heading, say, using CSS. For identifiers like lowercase language codes, you should not do that because that might turn it into a country code. Or worse, turn it into something that looks like a country code but is actually not a valid country code. Different rules apply. They have different grammar. Um, and then you've got parsable languages, machine-readable languages like programming languages or markup languages. And maybe it should be a separate category. I'm not really sure. Um, mini languages like regular expressions, these again have completely different rules. You can't go messing around with uppercase, lowercase, although they might not be sensitive to white space. Um, and finally, you have data, which again is arguably the same thing as the parsed languages, because what they share is that they often have a defined grammar, um, unlike natural language, where sometimes you think it might be convenient if you could validate a sentence in English. Um, but that's not how it works. Um, so this is a bit of a digression, but it's worth following the thought, the chain of thought, that there's more than one kind of text, and maybe you shouldn't mix them up in your model. Maybe it's worth, at least at some stage during your modeling, thinking about what kind of text is this value that I'm storing as a string, and is there a defined standard for this? Is it a named language? identify which language it is. Is it a unique code according to which standard? Um, after all, people need to look up things like what are the valid values. And if you're lucky, it's something like a published standard where you can use other people's documentation, which is your reward, right? Because you don't want to write docs yourself. So text values can be very problematic. Some are less bad than others. Let's move on to addresses. Um, addresses contain various values, um, such as the countries I mentioned earlier. They have country codes. But addresses are kind of funky and awkward because, well, they're non-standard and country-specific. So the first problem is that countries do not appear here visually. Countries are a bit of a construct. Um, and so when I talked about country codes earlier on, I was, I was not being completely accurate. In the ISO standard, they're called country and area codes because not all of them are countries. And some of them are countries maybe depending on who you ask. So if you want a country code for, let's say, a country like the Netherlands, then that's not so problematic. You know, it's, it's NL. If you want a list of the country codes for the countries, now you have a problem because by country, you probably really mean sovereign state. And what is a sovereign state? It's something that other people recognize as a sovereign state which creates a bit of a definition problem. So they all have um, two-letter codes, but then lots of things that are not countries, at least according to some people, have two-letter codes as well. Um, there are various candidates for the list of countries. Um, I guess one of the less terrible but still not good enough ones is the list of United Nations members. 
But you know, this is still not great because it includes plenty of countries which are not recognized by other countries. Um, 18 of the UN members listed here are not universally recognized as sovereign states. Four of them don't, aren't even recognized by emoji. I mean, what a slap in the face that is. Um, so country is a bit of a fluid concept. What do you do about this? You, again, go back to what I said earlier about names, is think about purpose. For what purpose do we need the name of a country or to identify a country? Um, if you want to ship something to somebody, if you're doing logistics, if you're selling something, then you're talking about a shipping address, and that narrows the problem a bit. Um, for the purposes of international logistics, then that's more of a standardized list. Again, there are some edge cases, but you know, you're starting to get onto better ground. So again, think about purpose. I mean, in theory, things like postcodes would help with shipping things, but the map is not completely consistent there. So the one thing that surprised me about this map is I didn't realize that most countries don't use letters in their postcodes. Um, the green countries use letters as well as digits. I, I appear to have been born in one of them and have moved to one of the others. Um, and there aren't very many others on this map. Turns out everybody else is much more sensible and just uses digits to specify postcodes. Um, but there are also some gray areas, which is problematic. So even postcodes is not a universal idea. You know, it's, it's country specific. It turns out that you know, not even that much more than half of countries that you can send post to even have postcodes. I mean, mostly they're digits. I did discover that Ireland is totally winning because they, when they finally introduced postcodes about 10 years ago, this is quite recent, they are now the only country with postcode per unique address, which is, I think, pretty cool. That's how everybody should have done it. Um, I guess nobody thought of that. Um, so the model is country specific. Uh, for a particular country, it's a bit more accessible, but if you want to model an international address, you should be much less ambitious and you should be a bit scared about implementing a postcode, especially if you think you want to validate that postcode. Um, some countries make it easier than others. Um, at least you can cheat and spend money and make it easier. So in the, US, in the UK, for example, you can buy the, well, probably a subscription or license to the postcode address file. This lets you basically cheat on the whole notion of delivery address for a whole country and treat address not as a collection of fields that you need to think about, but as a single value of an enumerated type with 30 million values that you downloaded or accessed via an API. And that does solve the problem. This is important in that particular country because among all of the things that are messed up in the UK, addresses are a nightmare. They're very unstructured, very inconsistent. Dutch addresses are so neat and tidy by comparison. You know, this idea that you have a street line and a, um, a, a town or a commenter and a postcode. The UK, you might have six or seven lines, and the first few might sound like a description of how to find the next line. You know, it's the, it's the box around the corner from the post office down, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Not even kidding. Um, so, I mean, but it makes sense that street addresses are bad because they date back you know, to the dawn of civilization, whereas something more modern like email address is surely absolutely fine. Um, I mean, except that you, know, you would have to kind of somehow get four different RFCs into your head uh, to work out what is even a correctly formed email address. So the thing that comes up worse with email addresses is not really, well, similar to, similar to delivery addresses, is you're asking people what is their address, and you want to check if they got it right. At least you want to help them out because people make mistakes and type things in that are just wrong. Oh, or they lie, there's that too. But validating an email address um, is problematic. So thinking about validation is one of the reasons why just calling something text is not good enough. Because otherwise you're, you're in the realm of, you're, or at least you're at the mercy of the software testers. You know, if you say your email address is just text, then the tester is trying it with an empty string, with a four gigabyte string, that kind of stuff, with every possible Unicode character. Um, at least you can check that the address is potentially correct according to the RFC. You might think that's enough, um, but it isn't really because you probably don't want to allow every possible domain. You probably don't want to allow domains that don't exist. 
you probably don't want to allow example.com, which is definitely not somebody's real email address, that kind of thing. Um, maybe for specific applications, you only want domains for a particular organization. So you probably want to check the domain somehow. And just because it's in the right format and the domain exists doesn't mean that that's actually an, uh, an existing email address at that domain. So if you want to get to level three validation, you need to actually send the email and see if it bounces. Um, just looking at the text isn't going to work. And that's not even enough because you still don't know if you emailed the correct person. You now you need some kind of uh, authentication code. So validating things can lead you down a different kind of rabbit hole. Um, email addresses are tricky because apparently they're not so terrible that we've replaced them with something else, at least not completely. Um, and then it gets worse than that because... Well, I used to think that it was fine to say this is valid according to the RFC, so allow me to enter this email address and complain when something that was strictly valid according to the RFC would be rejected, not a valid email address. So there are some features of some email servers, like putting a plus sign plus garbage after it, that are allowed. Yeah, and I don't want you to dis disallow my, email ad my Gmail address with a plus sign. That is, that's legitimate. So rejecting that would be bad. But there are lots of edge cases in the email format spec that nobody really uses and that your software should not allow for the following reason. It's valid according to the spec, but the only two groups of people who use them are security researchers and attackers. And the people who are not expecting them are the programmers who built your application. And so they represent a security risk if you allow them. Because, sure, they're valid, but you've got a bit of a risk that people weren't handling them properly. So you should probably restrict it a bit, and now it gets a bit fuzzy again. Um, you'll notice that there are two words that I did not use on this slide. Who knows what they are? The first one's regular. <laughs> and the second one is expression, indeed. Um, if you want to use a regular expression to validate your email address, good luck with that. There is a Java library that does it using a code API, and it basically implements the whole of the specification. And it has this regular expression. Um, which is what you can generate from that code library to validate uh, a valid according to the spec email address. And so it turns out that email addresses are the YAML of values in modeling. Um, yeah, they're useful, but a more elegant design might have been less of a horror. Anyway, so that was names and addresses and identifiers. Um, it sort of feels like everything else should be simpler from here. Um, at least so far, some things are not so bad. Some things have standards, and some things are fine until they have some weird edge case, and then you get stuck. Genders, what could possibly go wrong here? Um, I, have a, I have a quiz for you on the next slide. There are two things... Well, there's more than one thing wrong with this form, but let's say there are two things that are particularly wrong with this form, this form field, or this, this modelled attribute as such. Um, the, the, the first one is that somebody's maybe modelled it as a Boolean. Um, here's one for the Scala programmers. Uh, maybe this works in other JVM languages. If you're, if you're properly type safe, two, in, in many contexts, two is the incorrect number. Um, but actually, it's worse than that. I mean, it's, you know, just having two is sort of non-inclusive, but asking in the first place is GDPR violation bad because... If you are um, having, you know, if you're processing people's profiles, and you're putting, then you've got personal data, and personal data has to be minimised. So you are required to not ask for things you don't need. And let's face it, your marketing sign-up form does not need to ask for gender. There are so the other thing wrong with the form, the the field, is that it's even there in the first place, right? So the correct answer is, don't even ask. This is fairly bad. This is GDPR non-compliance. I mean, you might want to cross your fingers and suppose that somebody else is going to get fined first. You might think that, I'm a programmer, this is legal's problem. Um, I chatted to a lawyer friend of mine about that particular idea, and uh, he, he laughed at me and said, don't assume that legal's on top of this. I mean, they've got just as many deadlines as you have and overflowing email inbox. They are not on top of the personal data processing in the software that you wrote yesterday. So you do have a responsibility. This is the slide that may not be unseen. And it's even worse than that. I mean, particularly, don't ask for gender because you don't need it. 
Um, but also be careful about making it even worse than that. Uh, is that a question? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, I work for like, uh, a medical administration system, and I think medical professionals would need to know if a person is, has or was originally born male or female because there's other stuff that happens with like, the kind of care they receive, which is still not as presented now. So the question is, if you are building a certain kind of medical system where it's relevant to the purpose of the system, would you still not ask for gender? Um, so you've anticipated a future slide, but I might as well do this now. Um, as I said with the other examples, model according to the purpose. So all of the software that I've ever built over more than two decades, I never actually needed gender in there. I haven't worked on that system. I haven't worked on the passport application form. There are a few places where you are required or need to ask for the gender and, and, do, you know, and do pass this test. And then you definitely need it in writing from legal. I mean, definitely do that. Um, but you need to pass that test of actually needing it for the purpose. So model things for the purpose. And that also answers the next question of how many genders are we talking about. So if you're asking someone their gender for a passport application form, there will be legislation for the relevant country about which values are valid. Increasingly, you're allowed to have an X on your passport as your gender, at least when I say increasingly, there are now more than zero countries that allow that, for example. But that's the kind of thing you need to know about it. So yes, but probably not. Um, it depends what you're building. Um, it gets worse. So I've got a fun special case for you. Um, personal data violation is pretty bad in terms of GDPR non-compliance. But GDPR has, in, in Article 9, has a special section on special categories of personal data where you can uh, achieve a whole new level of non-compliance and, uh, and doing bad, and one of those is accidentally inferring somebody's sexual orientation by asking not only for their gender, but their partner's gender, or at least the other adults who live at the same address. Um, definitely don't do that. So TLDR, build unisex software. Um, your software is probably not gender specific, especially if you're you know, doing something businessy for finance or supply chain. Um, and, and if you think you do, then you know, it's your responsibility as a programmer to, to run that by legal and have things in writing. Um, and stepping back a little bit, if you're modelling a value and you think that the correct data type is Boolean, you are almost certainly wrong. Don't model things as Boolean. Start with enumerations, and there are probably more than two values. Um, moving on to a much more fun section, um, numbers. Numbers are far more nerdy. Um, Numbers are also very neat and tidy in software and data storage because they're numeric and they, they map easily to database fields and things like that. So, you know, just like house numbers, for example, because house numbers are numerical and they're, they're ordered, sequential, except, of course, when they are none of those things. Um, I lived in this house when I was a small child for a couple of years, and that's my grandmother looking out the door there. All of the houses on this short street by the beach in the south of England do not have digits as their house number, they all have names. That one's called the boathouse. Um, yeah, so when we say house number, we mean numbers except, you know, 1, 2A, the boathouse. These are all valid numbers. Modeling danger. Okay, so house numbers are problematic. Telephone numbers surely are fine. I mean, they are more numeric. I mean, at least they more consistently use digits and you're less likely to have the boathouse be a valid telephone number. But they're still not really numbers because the punctuation matters, the leading zeros matter, um, so don't go losing those and storing it in a numeric type. And the other thing that then comes up with some of these value types is that there are different display formats. So I haven't mentioned this yet, but part of understanding and modeling values is not just how can you store it or what, what data type would you need to represent it, and it's not just how would we validate whether this is a legit value, but also what should it look like when we show it to people. Not necessarily the same as how you would store it, you see. So you probably want to store telephone numbers ideally in one of these ways, but show them in another way, which is then country specific. And it's worse than that, because in many countries, the format is not just country specific, but specific to what kind of number it is. Um, and in many countries, you can't even infer by pattern matching whether it's a mobile number or a landline, for example. Um, you can't always group the digits correctly. 
So countries that use uh, parentheses around numbers for some kind of subgrouping thing, um, that's just awful for programmers. Try to avoid that somehow. And I sort of can't help you here because this is, it's got awkward historical things and people expect things. Although there are some quite, severs, uh, some quite clever software libraries that really just have a lot of data about this prefix implies this format. Um, used by, for example, providers of mobile phones that run Kotlin. You might find some software libraries from those people. What you don't find is helpful international standards because there are all sorts of telecom standards, but they're not really helpful for the data. So this sort of notation thing, this E123 standard, you know, says you should totally group uh, numbers. You know, we do grouping by spaces. I think everybody ignores this stuff. Um, you can format a telephone number as a URL. Don't think I've ever seen anybody really do that. And that might be a good way to store, like to normalize numbers for storage. That might make comparisons easier. But then how are you going to format that in a kind of non-ugly way? Like, where would you put the spaces? So that's problematic. So formatting and storage, you might want to be separate, but you might now introduce a, a hard unsolvable problem, or at least one that you would need actual AI for. Um, or an extremely big database of just everybody's phone numbers and what they expect them to look like. So other people's data might be the solution here. Um, I mean, in theory, right, it's a finite list. And let's take another kind of number. So this is my um, favorite one for today, um, aircraft tail numbers. So tail number is the sort of colloquial term for the aircraft registration numbers that appear on the sides of aircraft, underneath the wing, if you can just about see it, contrast isn't very good, sometimes literally on the tail. Um, the problem with tail, well, tail numbers are awful. Uh, I mean, the first two letters, they've got, they've got letters and a dash, and then some other bit. And the first bit before the dash is a, is a country code. And it's not an ISO 3166-1 two-letter code. It's just not. All aircraft registered in the Netherlands are identified as PH. Um, I mean, that's my initial, so I think that's kind of cool. Um, but that's not why. Um, I tried to look it up. Uh, it used to be just the H, like, you know, 100 years ago. H for Holland, which is completely correct. Um, except somebody thought that would be confusing because countries like Hungary also have a name starting with H. So it was changed to PH to be less confusing somehow. Um, <laughs> as well as PA, PB, and some other sort of stuff. There was, there was the whole ranges of it. Um, but crucially, you know, in the other unique part, so it forms a unique thing. Um, I seem to remember that, you know, some of them, I mean, you can do, like, vanity registrations. I think the new uh, Dutch government aircraft is registered as PH-Gov. So, cool. Um, but they're not numeric, right? Tail number, definitely, definitely no digits here, or maybe digits, depends on the country. Um, so... Good unique identifier, got some history, don't worry too much about the structure, not numeric. Um, I chatted to you earlier about international bank account numbers, um, hi Eric, and, and these are kind of a bit more in the right direction. In fact, in fact the IBAN is, is a thing of beauty, it's got a proper standard, it, it does have an ISO country code at the start, so that's, that's good. I mean, the number of digits varies by country, so that's a little bit disappointing. Um, but it does have check digits and a very fancy validation algorithm, so that's much better than email address. Like, you just need to implement the algorithm and not get it wrong, or, or maybe use a library for that. Um, yeah, so the good news is it is used where, where we are right now. It's, the bad news is it's not used in most of the world, um, which is a bit of a shame, really. Um, and it's sort of used in you know, a lot of Middle East and Africa. Um, so some numbers are great, provided that your context doesn't go further than that. Um, at least this is a great improvement. You know, and IBAN took a many years and lots of national legislation in different countries to introduce. But this is, this is progress, this sort of progress towards standardized numbers. Standardized numbers are very satisfying and have other people's documentation. So that's what we want in a programming environment. Um, other standard numbers, we all know about the book numbers. Um, I quite like the wine numbers. That's quite a, a, a good thing to have. Um, and the, the article numbers, the EANs, that's the barcodes on products. Um, I'm, uh, I'm reading a book at the moment by my next-door neighbour in Rotterdam who wrote a book about the music business and, and tells a story about the time when, um, with this kind of like new record label, they, they found out that it costs 
I don't know, something like 30 guilders to buy a bunch of, of barcodes. Uh, so they just sort of went to the supermarket and like kind of bought some products and just copied those and put them on the CDs, which worked until it didn't because, you know, then somebody tried to buy one of the CDs in the shop and it's like, you know, coffee filters. That's, that's, that's wrong. Um, but there is a right way to do that. And if you do it the right way, then you can participate in lots of international commerce in a, in a nice standardised way. So especially when people want to sell things, these problems have often been solved in a good way. Um, although if you're unlucky, they were solved several decades ago in a kind of clunky but good way uh, that we're now stuck with. Um, so your mileage varies about how good they are. But the existence of these kinds of, of standardised identifiers generally helps you. So these are all called numbers. Most of them are not actually numbers. So what's going on there? So down the rabbit hole on modelling numbers is that there are three kinds of numbers. Um, mathematically, you're usually talking about cardinal numbers, so which is the number of things you have, the size of a set, a quantity. And this is pretty much what you want to be using numeric types for in software. I think it's very tragic that programming environments don't separate ordinal numbers so the, the, the position in the list. So one and first are different. One is the cardinal number, first is the ordinal. Um, we don't have ordinal numbers in code or data. I, th I kind of feel that if we did, then array indexes never would have been a problem because arrays don't start at zero or one, they start at first. That would be good. And then it would be a type error to kind of like say, you know, array.length as an index because it's... Anyway, that's also a different talk. Um, but most of the numbers that we've been seeing are identifiers, and numbers as identifiers are uh, what we call nominal numbers. They don't have the same arithmetic. So remember when I was looking at the different kinds of text, they don't have the same grammar. Some you can uppercase some without changing the meaning, and some you can't. Um, the nominal numbers have a different kind of arithmetic, so you know, adding two house numbers together is not particularly interesting. I mean, maybe there's a counterexample. Um, I mean, the average of two house numbers might be. I don't know. Average house number in your street? Uh, not sure. You know, it doesn't have the same kind of thing. You really need to just treat them as opa um, opaque identifiers that you don't mess around with and accept that they have non-digits, so in, at least in the non-mathematical sense. Um, I've added some languages there just to point out that English is very unhelpful here by using the same word for number and number, whereas in some languages, and I think I think I've got these right, but it's a bit subtle that there are separate words for what you call number. Um, I've got a good Rotterdam story. So in, in Erasmus MC in, in Rotterdam, the, the biggest hospital in the Netherlands, they introduced a new patient management system. The old system had, um, um, it had a patient number, which is Dutch for patient number as a unique identifier. And this is useful in conversation because when you're talking about a patient, you need to confirm patient number, so the staff would, you know, check, is this the right person, because that's kind of important in a lot of medical procedures to do it on the right person. Um, you check the patient number. Anyway, they had a new system that was somehow in English, and it was now called a patient ID, which you'd abbreviate as PID, and everybody just calls that a PID. And apparently it took no time for all of the staff to just call it a PID number, it has to be called a number. You know, ID is a very programmer-specific term. Anyway, that's not the interesting takeaway. The interesting takeaway for you today is that if your attribute has the word number in its name, it is not a number. It's text. Numbers are kind of a special case, I guess. So let's try and sort of summarise the message here a little bit. Um, I've taken you through the idea that you can be gradually more strict about how you model things. Um, YOLO modeling is when you'll accept anything, stuff it into a long text, anywhere from empty string to four gigabytes in your database. It's all good. Stringly type programming as opposed to strongly type programming. Um, is, you know, it's very common, especially historically, and there are many environments where everything is text. Um, and that's why once upon a time we all wrote things in Perl because it's all about processing text. I feel that we've moved on in that being a bit less common than it was. Um, and at least knowing the difference between text and the number is good. I mean, if you're lucky between a number and a date, sorry, Jason. Um, at least having some notion of different types helps. 
Um, but it's not much, actually, because it doesn't help with most of these examples. All of those numbers were still text. So constraint types are better in that sense. Um, this is what you get when you add a schema that says only certain numbers are valid or only certain patterns of text are, are valid. It, you, you know, you, you, this is how you defeat the, the tester who turns up with the four gigabyte string to test your text input field um, with, you know, with, with patterns and such. And of course the gold standard is somebody else's published standard because then they've done all of the work, but otherwise the same kind of result. Um, ideally it's actually published, not like ISO who will put it online but not provide it for free. Although jokes on ISO because the Wikipedia page is generally good enough these days, I guess. Um, thinking through this helps you do better modeling of the universal values that appear in your code. Um, but you need to be careful. So personal names are problematic. Don't try and standardize or validate those. Everything you assume is wrong. Um, where you can use the ISO codes, that will save you a lot of time. It's not overkill. It's never overkill. Check out Unicode CLDR. It's a bit of a beast, but it can uh, save your bacon. Lots of useful stuff there. Um, country lists and other lists are political and social. So a lot of this stuff is, is not as simple as simply um, looking at a kind of data type or a schema definition. Some things need a bit more focus on where you are. In particular, your software is probably unisex. Make it unisex, please. Please do that. Um, there are four levels of email address validation. It's not a regular expression. That's not enough. And indeed, as I said, model the identifiers that are called numbers, model those as text. These are the rough guidelines, and this is sort of where I got to on loose stuff to tell you. If you want to take a step back, there are two more important bits to the summary, which is totally not this slide. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to be here. Um, the first important thing is that this is specific to purpose. So the question about gender, are you building a medical system? Is this healthcare software or not? Are you building government software that legally is required to ask for it? Um, think about having separate, separate names for, sorry, think about having separate attributes for different parts of people's names. So, you know, while kind of Dutch personal name data modeling takes you in the wrong direction with the Tussefuchsel, um, nicknames being fairly standard here, the Rupnam, that's super helpful because that's the concept that you need for the, um, the cheery salutation uh, in an email notification that you want to send to somebody. Um, that exists in other countries as well. Um, often in Thailand, people have very long, full names and a very short nickname. Um, so let people use those. Don't assume that the nickname is part of the full name or one of the words in the full name. I mean, that's something that totally confused me moving to this country. That that's, you know somebody I've known the whole time, you know, as as Bob is really called Alexander or something <laughs> on their passport, but never use it in public. So think about purpose and think about domain. Um, model these values according to the domain that you're in, and different domains have very different requirements. So again, with the, you know, the, the, the gender example, you know, sometimes, well, I mean, generally you shouldn't ask, but maybe a dating app would be more fun if gender were free text, and you can encourage uh, some creativity there, and, and uh, you know, it's much less... Uh, Limiting than just identifying as a, let's say, a man, but what kind of man is your ideal partner looking for? Anyway, um, if you want to read about any of this stuff, um, I've written it, it's all in my blog. Um, just remember that it's, there's a tag for the DDD stuff. Click, 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 all done. <laughs> Last chance. Thank you.